can we be patient long enough to listen to perspectives which may not be ours and understand the value and validity in those perspectives. Hello and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today we welcome my dear friend Christine Robinson on the show. Christine is an executive coach, consultant, facilitator, and strategist whose expertise lies in building pathways to policy and systems change. She has worked as a consultant to the White House, the Ford Foundation, Harvard Medical School, the Lumina Foundation, and other notable organizations. Christine studied at Vassar College, Brandeis University, and the University of Pennsylvania, and is trained as a developmental and community psychologist. In fact, that's the topic of our chat today, community psychology. It's an exciting new field, and Christine has really impacted the field in really innovative ways. In order to nurture a culture of well-being, Christine says it's crucial to acknowledge the multifaceted identities of individuals. Instead of seeing marginalized groups as others, she encourages us to view diversity as a valuable asset to society. She argues we need to listen to everyone's perspective before we can bring social change and co-create an inclusive and equitable community. This was a really fun chat with a dear friend, and I'm excited to bring it to you today. So without further ado, I give you my discussion with Christine Robinson. Christine, I'm so excited to chat with you today on the podcast. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so very much for the invitation. Yeah, well, I've been a, a great admirer of your work for many years now, and I'm excited to, to get it, uh, shine a spotlight on it on the podcast. I thought we would start off with a quote from Margaret Wheatley um, that says, all social change begins with a conversation. Why do you like that quote so much? Because I feel as though if we can't talk about things, we're not going to make any headway. And I think this is true. First of all, it's kind of a foundational precept in looking at not only psychology, but every single discipline in our personal lives, our professional lives, in uh, the societal life and societal discourse. I think that we all find that if we struggle through conversations, if we don't share common meanings and understandings of words and concepts, that we're really at a disadvantage. And I think that the just the capacity to talk, um, sometimes talking puts us at loggerheads, which is really interesting, particularly if we do not have this share the same meaning or understanding around terminology. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, we, we haven't really covered uh, the topic of community psychology that much on this podcast. So I was really excited to be able to feature that. And then, of course, feature your your enhancements uh, to the definition of it uh, that exists in the field. But could we start off with sort of the traditional definition of community psychology, how it tends to be thought of, um, some of the maybe a little bit of the origin story of the field, who are some of the key players in the beginning of it? Um, and then uh, and then we'll kind of we'll start talking about some of your uh, your redefinitions. Sure. Um, I think it's important to say that community psychology is an applied discipline, first of all. So it really tries to take a lot of psychological precepts and put them into practice where they're actually lived and part of the fabric of our lives, as opposed to being an academic exercise, even though there clearly is an academic discipline. In addition, community psychology goes beyond individual cultural, it goes beyond an individual frame to really look at a lot of the cultural, uh, political, economic, and environmental frames. And so uh, the multidisciplinary piece, I think, is really important because it draws very heavily on a number of other disciplines, being sociology and anthropology and public health and a number of other perspectives. It also tries to expand a lot of concepts. So beyond the psychological precept of helping, it really looks at this whole question around wellness and what is wellness and what is well-being. And so the paradigm shift is in some of the nuances there. The um, field is very much focused on action-oriented research. And so a lot of it is field research, um, looking at practitioners in the field, um, making certain that theory is related to practice and that it is something that is actually accessible um, by people in community, a very high value on lived experience. And so not only those who have a lot of expertise from an academic perspective, but the voices of people who are directly affected. 
uh, built on a foundation of collaboration relationships. So looking not only at interpersonal relationships, but how organizations and systems are aligned as well. And there's a, a, a strong interest in looking at government, civic life, civic health, civic discourse. And, and finally, there's a commitment to really address inequities and social inequities and oppression. Um, and so the framework is much more um, expansive than traditional psychology that may be much more focused on the individual. And in addition, it is a field that finds no challenge in taking research to practice and also invites an authentic dialogue where people can come in as equal partners as to how we address community issues. Very strongly influenced by the work of uh, Dr. Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Full disclosure, I should just state that I had the wonderful opportunity to be one of his students when I did graduate work at Cornell. So the socio-ecological framework is um, a foundational piece of this work and the ability, the reciprocity, if you start with how an individual is nested within a family, nested within a neighborhood, a community, a church, a school, a workplace, within a, a region, a municipality, for example, a state and the nation. And so if you go in and out, there's a reciprocal effect of actually how that nation state has implications for us, us all as individuals. And we're seeing that pronounced now, for example, in COVID-19. So the, the field actually developed in the 1960s. Um, and I hope that that's helpful, Scott. Incredibly helpful. I, I was such a fan of uh, Broffenbrenner's work um, in grad school. I mean, I'm still a fan, but when I first discovered it, I became an instant fan. And personally, I was trying to see how it could be applied to understanding of intelligence and and uh, how we kind of uh, measure intelligence and, and uh, treat it sometimes as though it purely comes from within and isn't influenced by the sociocultural mm -hmm. in, environment, and I, I really loved the really the nuance and the the rich sort of tapestry of the theory and how it combines lots of different factors. Um, doesn't ignore ability, uh, but it also includes um, the community, you know. And I so it, I'm a big fan, and I think that's amazing that you you met him. Can can you or that you worked with him? You, he was your mentor. Can you kind of tell us a little bit more what he was like as a person? I've never met, I never met him, so I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> a brilliant salt of the earth kind of person. No pretension, very, very open and incredibly expansive in his thinking. So he was one of my professors uh, when I did graduate work in Cornell at the uh, College of Human Ecology and Human Development and Family Studies. Um, I was fortunate enough to be one of his students as he was in the process of refining um, his, his work on uh, human ecology and mm. putting together this theory, which was incredibly expansive. But what was fascinating in that opportunity at the time was the deep conversations that he had with graduate students at that time about his thinking. Um, which quite frankly, for many of us, and I'll be honest myself very much, and I'll speak for myself here, was very hard to grasp because it was so multifaceted on so many different layers and so many different levels, very complex and extraordinarily intricate. And I don't think to this day that we've really fully appreciated the magnitude, an incredibly generous man, very, very gracious, um, always had time and always had room, um, just an extraordinary person. And I, I, I'm deeply grateful for having had that opportunity. Wow, he sounds like such a good person. And and I love when, that, when a, good, a good person is also a good researcher. <laughs> when those two things match up, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Stacey was in that department as well, right? Was he there at the time? He was. He was. He was mm -hmm. there at the time. And what I should also mention about Bronfenbrenner is I don't think that he ever overcame his own background. As you probably know, he was from Russia, a Russian family originally. And so this whole issue around context and the environmental context and how the culture has implications for our lives coming from Russia to the U.S. and being raised in a family with traditions in a Russian family 
a kind of context being then coming to the U.S. in a U.S. context, I think that that is an example of how lived experience can be really powerful in the lives of researchers. And actually bringing also, it parallels with bringing the voices of those directly affected, because part of that voice was his own experience and understanding and his own family's history. So here you're getting into issues around historical psychology and biographical psychology and a whole host of um, paradigms that one could use and look at more intentionally. And he personified and actually encouraged his students to do so. Absolutely. And I uh, thought maybe you could even unpack his theory a little more in the sense that he uh, he emphasized that all areas of the puzzle of a healthy ecosystem are inextricably linked to each other. Could you maybe unpack that a little more? What, mm -hmm. does, what in the world does that mean, what I just said? <laughs> well, I see Bronfenbrenner in the extraordinarily powerful words of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And because we are doing this podcast, we're recording it on we're recording MLK it on Day, yeah. Day. <laughs> even though it That's won't true. be released today. I just want to read a quote that I pulled up this morning in preparation. Um, and it's from his letter uh, from a Birmingham jail. In a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated struggle of reality. And I think that that quote kind of laid on top of the socio-ecological framework that Brown from Brinter um, developed are, it's another way of saying exactly the same way, the same thing in slightly different language, but the interrelationship and the interdependencies, which I think we sometimes miss, unfortunately, so many scholars and academic fields are very wedded to a certain type of approach and a paradigm. And I'm not saying that they're not of value, but I think that we silo at our peril. And a lot of times, if we are so narrow in the frame, we cannot recognize the interdependencies. And both the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King and the socio-ecological framework talk about our interdependencies. And sometimes I do believe that in the U.S. and our culture and psychology as a field sometimes looks at this notion of as an independent individual, how you ought to be and how you can move forward. Another MLK quote is, it's a cruel joke to ask somebody who has no boots to pull them up by their bootstraps. Yeah. And I would add to that, it's a cruel, even crueler to ask someone who has no feet to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Wow. So we have traditionally marginalized, for example, people who are disabled. And so looking at some of the terms that we use and the assumptions that we make and a, a lack of reality of various life experiences, opportunities, and how groups have been marginalized. And so I think that both the work of King and the work of Bronfenbrenner provide frameworks for which us to explore those realities more intentionally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And your work, all on its own, is pretty, pretty darn awesome. Um, I, if I must say so myself, um, you mention how well-being is far from uniform, and you talk in your work about certain concepts. I'd love to unpack a little bit. Two concepts in particular I thought were really interesting: the idea of community well-being and the idea of collective efficacy. Could you talk a little bit about those two concepts? And uh, I mean, they're obviously very much linked to each other. Of course. And I think that part of this whole question around community well-being is how communities have an ethos where there is an issue of both. And, and a lot of my work, I should also honor the work and another mentor, person I've had the great privilege of working and thinking with, and one who I know you know is Dr. Isaac Bralotinsky. And he uh, talks about him. the whole issue around mattering. And so mattering, as he defines it, I believe is both 
adding value and being valued. And so in a community well-being, there is a value. And this is very much premised in a lot of principles of positive psychology when we look at assets. But unfortunately, in many communities, we do not necessarily look at people with a disability or someone who is an English language learner or someone who is an undocumented um, immigrant or a refugee in looking at their assets. And if we really believe in the inherent dignity of all people, to me, that's a foundational precept of community well-being. Because therefore, it means that we will value you and what you bring and how your worldview, what your worldview is, how you see things has value. It's very different from a very stark black, white, right, wrong framework, which means that there's a lot of room for nuances there and it invites people in as they are. And so looking at the opportunity for us to really have an inclusive community of grace where we value those assets to me is at the heart of community well-being. Um, and I do think that sometimes we've lost um, some of those elements, particularly as we speak now, this is uh, January of 2022, there are um, a, a lot of polarization um, that I do believe is really stressing people on an individual and a community level. COVID-19 is certainly brought to the fore this whole notion around interdependency. I don't wear a mask and I'm putting other people at risk. Um, I don't get a vaccine and I put other people at risk. And I'm speaking to you from Massachusetts where hospitals have asked people and rescheduled surgeries, even for people who have cancer, to say that we don't oh. have enough space here for you to come in. And they're beginning to prioritize um, because uh, physicians are, are caring for people in hallways. There just isn't the person power, not only in Massachusetts, but as I understand from listening to news clips, it's happening across the country. So if we indeed do prescribe to community wellness and collective efficacy, and going back to Bronfenbrenner and Dr. King, it's an acknowledgement of our interdependencies. And what I do does matter. It affects my neighbor, my family, my friends, people in my workplace, in my school, in my community. And my participation also can enhance others' well-being. The way that I look at things, my worldview may be a paradigm shift for you and a conversation that you and I have, Scott, that may encourage you to look at things at a different way. And I certainly should honor your brilliance, Scott, in saying you certainly have encouraged me to look at things in a different way. And this, to me, is at the heart of, of a conversation and saying it starts with a conversation at the heart of community well-being and also at the heart of collective efficacy. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the conversation part for sure. Yeah, um, uh, I'm going to read a quote of yours I really like because I think inextricably intertwined with um, what you're just saying are is the idea of social identity, and this gets at the heart of a lot of your work. I've known you for a couple years now, and I know that this is something you're really, really deeply passionate about, and you've done great work around. So I'm going to read this quote about it, social identities. You say, our multiple social identities and the cultural externalities of our lives are inextricably linked and ground self-perception, behavior, relationships, and the evaluation of others. Can you kind of unpack that quote a little bit more and why is, uh, why is our social identity such an important part of uh, our humanity? Um, of course, and a lot of my work really prescribes and it's based very strongly on the work of um, Kimberly Crenshaw, law professor at UCLA and intersectionality, because every single one of us has more than one identity. We can identify, and it's really a question of, you know, uh, some people call a master, a master status or a master identity, but almost all of us have a race or ethnicity and some gender identity, be it male, female, gender, non-binary. A lot of us very strongly identify with a religion, uh, with a cultural background, with a language background. Many of us identify with a profession. Here we are talking about on a psychology podcast. So how, who we are 
it, it has a lot to do with how we've been socialized. Uh, those of us who are Christian are socialized, for example, differently than those of us who are Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist, for example. Our traditions and our culture have a lot to do and inform our worldviews. And I do believe that a lot of times this puts us at loggerheads. It also is a question to me, Scott, of also looking at meaning making, because it's a question of if we look at these qualities of our identities, an essentialist might say that there is an essential distinction or difference between someone who comes from any one of those identities. And even though we look at the science, we know that there's not a biological difference between someone who is black or someone who is Jewish or someone who is Muslim. But a um, constructionist believes that these kind of identities are constructed through a social process. And I think that that in and of itself, when we just talk about identity and how we make meaning of those identities, is this a biological predictor or something? And unfortunately, the biological prediction, as we all know, has gotten us into a slippery slope of deciding who matters and who doesn't and who's better or not, and the whole issue of stigma. And so I'll, I'll pick disabled people, for example, is looking at them as broken people, um, as opposed to looking at their brilliance and the numbers of folks who live with disabilities and live glorious lives and are extraordinarily productive. And so that doesn't, you don't have to be consigned to the margins. But unfortunately, identity, it's a question of how it's the meaning making question to me. Um, and that definition in and of itself of you believe it's a social process, which to me clearly is where I stand versus an essentialist who thinks that this is a predestination almost, um, and, and, and it's an objective category. Um, and I, I think that this is part of the, the challenge and the clash that we are having presently in the United States. What um, specifically are you referring to as, uh, as, as a social category? Are you talking about I identities, like specifically? Yes. What are you referring to? Yes. Okay. Yes. Our, our identity is socially constructed, meaning through how we're socialized, or are they a biological trait? So if you are born with a disability or you are born as a black person, is that an essential trait that is part of you and part of your genetic makeup that makes you essentially different from someone else? And that's the essentialist piece. The constructive piece is looking at the political and legal and economic and religious institutions, the socialization process, and sees that that's a social construction. Um, I would hazard to say that every single person who is Black or who is Jewish or has a disability, whatever the case may be, is not exactly the same. There are some people who really want to try to boil it down to categories that are very linear and very discrete. Um, I do believe that clearly the psychological field allows the individual manifestation of various identities to differ. So one person who has an LGBTQ identity is not the same as another who has an LGBTQ identity. Some folks would view them as all being the same, all being deficit damaged, and that's more of the essentialist perspective. Are, are, are you following me, Scott? Yeah, but a big part of my identity for most of my life was and still is is neurodivergent, you know, and that was influenced by some mm -hmm. biological mm -hmm. characteristics. Um, I think what you're saying, which I'm 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 very much on, on board with, is the idea that uh, well, first of all, you're saying a lot of things. I mean, let's unpack this because this is really important. So, identity is something that you can choose to integrate into your day or not integrate, regardless of your characteristics, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. I know some people in the, for instance, in the gifted education community, don't want that as part of their identity, and some of them really do. Some people really embrace it. They say, you know, I. Um, I was, uh, I'm a gifted person, you know, when I was a child in school, I was a gift education. That's a, a really important part of my identity. And some people want to escape that identity from their school early, early childhood. So, and that's just one example that comes to mind. Cause I, I, I'm really interested in like underrepresentation of people in gifted education programs and that topic. So I think that's something that we're definitely both on board with, right. Is that, that idea that, um, 
your your biology to, is there isn't a one to one mapping there, you know, between your biology and your identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's very true. I I do not think that there's a one to one mapping, and I think that the whole question of meaning making of how we make meaning of our own identities and what that means to us. I do believe that the socialization process in the U.S. is extraordinarily powerful. And I often use the uh, work of Bobby Haro in looking at socialization that we're basically born as a blank slate, but then our families, the communities we live in, our schools, workplaces, even messages, billboards, uh, song lyrics, uh, television ads, um, define us and sort us and give us a sense of who matters, if you will, and who does not matter. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, some of these categories have been dehumanized. Um, And I do believe that the whole stigmatization of identities is really where we have a problem. As you, Scott, are talking about the neurodivergent community, um, Mm -hmm. some people would, would really, the whole issue of stigmatization in various identities is really, really problematic. So it's the distinction between how I view myself and how others view me. I have a good friend who grew up in the Bronx in the middle of a a Spanish-speaking community, and her first day of kindergarten when she was five was told, um, if you can't speak English, don't talk. Spanish is a dirty, nasty language, and we don't use it. And she's thinking as a five-year-old, these are my family. These are the people who love me, who've cared for me, and everyone I know, my priest, my the, the person who has the corner bodega, you know, my aunties, my grandparents, and what kind of statement is that about me and my culture? Um, so yeah. it, it's a, the issue of how it's defined externally and how we define it ourselves. And a lot of us are forced to code switch and... Um, do a lot of, of spanning of, of kind of a community we feel safe in to um, really flourish, um, taking from Seligman's words, and a community where we have to be very guarded. And the whole notion around chronic vigilance that's brought up in the, the work of um, Dr. David Williams and what chronic vigilance does to us over time, because we're constantly protecting our identities on ourselves um, for fear of, of being damaged, traumatized, the stress levels. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, That's a great, great point. And it relates to your point that othering can be a significant barrier to well-being. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, you know, what is, how how do you see othering? Um, What's your definition of that? Well, I see othering as being one of the major challenges of the the 21st century. It clearly was a challenge of the 20th century if you look at the Nazi concentration camps and the civil rights movements. But now I think that we are really in another wave of some of these stark um, marginalization. And I think in the U.S., it doesn't really matter. African American, Latinx, Native Indigenous with a disability, LGBTQ, neurodivergent. In a land of relative affluence, it's a struggle to be other. Um, It's this notion of constantly trying to assimilate. Um, Mm. Kenji Yoshina, a professor at uh, Yale, has written a book called Covering that talks about how we try to assimilate and cover our identities, that we want to fit in. Um, It's the issue of the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And the more that we assimilate and fit into a norm in the United States, um, there's very much a norm around a white dominant male culture. And it's brought to the fore very strongly in the work of Elizabeth Wilkerson, as she talks Mm -hmm. about in the book Cast, and basically aligning the U.S. system as a caste system. Um, A caste, as we all know, anybody who's broken a bone, it, 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 it mobilizes that bow. You cannot move. And so in a caste system, coming from the comparison of the U.S. social system with the system in India, is the notion that there's no way to move. There's no mobility. So the othered, all of those who are othered, be it because of race, ethnicity, documentation status, immigration status, they'd been in the, um, they'd been incarcerated, they'd been in the foster care system, 
how they can actually move out of that marginalized identity into an achievement of well-being. And sometimes it is very difficult because of the socialization process of being devalued by systems and culture and the internal messages that we get that I am less than. Women are less than men. Black folks are less than white folks. Uh, people who don't speak English as a first language are less than people who do speak English as a first language. Uh, the whole issue of heteronormativity and LGBTQ folks are other. Um, and then we go through a round of legal battles and everything else to get rights. But rights and actual, oh, kind of embracing perspectives and recognizing your inherent dignity are not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. A big, big core theme of your work is, is uh, respecting the inherent dignity of everyone. Where do you think we are in our society right now in terms of progress? Um, you know, you see, you know, there is a lot of cultural messaging um, that uh, is saying that uh, women are, are just as good as men and that um, uh, black lives, some black lives matter and me too. So let's just take those two big movements. Certainly, that's that's um, that's a development, uh, a shift in our culture that didn't from like even ten years ago, right? Certainly, fifty years ago, sixty years ago. Oh my gosh! So you know, so where do you mm -hmm. think we're at right now? And obviously, we're, we still have a long way to go. But I would say, in a lot of ways, our cultural messaging, writ large, isn't that you know only white men matter. <laughs> I mean, I'm seeing I'm seeing a huge cultural sort of shift. Are you seeing the same shift or are you not? Yeah. In some places, I think people are talking about it. It's the, as you said, Scott, we're seeing more messaging. And I agree with that. It's a distinction between messaging and taking theory to practice into action. So um, I know that President Obama, for example, signed into law the Lilly Ledbetter Act. And so when you look at pay equity, there's still gaps. You know, it takes several more months for women of color to reach pay equity with white women. It takes white women several months to gain pay equity with white men. So why is it that if you have the same education, same degrees, you are not valued as much? As a capitalistic system, a lot of U.S. is based on a market. And so the market-based economy kind of really is the ultimate arbiter of if we're moving towards that, there is more dialogue with some of the history, um, particularly as you look at asset strategies and struggles, is hard to overcome. Um, a lot of the work that I'd done earlier on was in looking at economic security and assets, and I was privileged to do work with the Ford Foundation in looking at the whole notion of closing the racial wealth gap. And when you have a history where land ownership was denied um, to African Americans, land was taken from Native and Indigenous folks. Um, Latinx fo people, a lot of them, you know, had land taken from them and were not allowed entry into. And so the history of such things as redlining and um, land loss is something that's still being fought and litigated. So the history that we have has automatically put some groups clearly at a disadvantage over others. So it's the question around equity. Um, and people are still trying to gain parity. So it, it's a daily struggle, I do believe. Yeah, um, for, for many people. Yeah, yeah. And for many people, they it's not the daily struggle. So it, because it's not part of their lived experience, it might be hard for them to uh, to recognize that it is very much a part of the lived experience for many people. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that kind of perspective mm -hmm. taking is absolutely essential. And and I agree, you know, it's important to recognize this is this is a daily struggle for, for millions and millions of Americans and obviously uh, or globally billions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, equity because you just mentioned that word. And I have um, not kept a secret that I absolutely adore your definition of equity. So I'm going to read it right now because I love it. You say equity means giving everyone what they need to succeed with the understanding that not everyone has had the same opportunities or ability to be heard. 
it seems like you, which I very much agree with, equate equity with equality of opportunity. Is that right? It's a, the, the opportunity mm-hmm. part's a big part of it. The opportunity part and the being heard part, going back to the importance of a conversation, Scott, is perspective sharing. So you mentioned Bronfenbrenner, and I talked a little bit about being in Russia and coming to the U.S. If I'm an immigrant, it doesn't matter where I'm from. If I'm from Vietnam or Cambodia or Mexico or from Rwanda, my perspective and the assets I bring can actually deepen the richness of pluralism in the U.S., and I think that it's the combination um, of both of those elements that's really, really important. I also like you use the word ability. I mean, you very rarely see the word ability, you know, in any definition of equity. So there's a lot of components of your definition I really like. Same opportunities or ability to be heard. So let, let's unpack mm-hmm. that. Let's let's double click on that. That's an area of mutual interest of ours, um, among other areas we've already discussed today. And that's you know this idea of um, you know even just people with disability, people with mental disability. So it doesn't just have to be physical disability when we use the word disability. Um, some people may have a certain abilities or skills that makes it difficult for them to be heard or be seen, um, to, to be recognized for the amazing strengths that do lie within them, but they're not able to express them as well. So how, do you, how does that play mm-hmm. out in some of your own work, that idea? Uh, Well, the ability piece, and I'll just be personal here for a brief moment. Uh, My only sibling was born severely brain damaged. And so growing up in the household with a brother who didn't speak, his ability to be heard was primarily, unfortunately, in the time that we grew up in the 60s and 70s was through my mother, um, who was the one who basically had to be the translator, advocate, Why is it that there are no schools for, at the time, so-called retarded children in the Cleveland, Ohio area? And so the ability piece was my mother often would ask the question, do people understand? And I, I would say at this point in time, no, I don't think they do, because they haven't lived that kind of life. And so the ability to be heard is, can you, it's the, the, the old adage we use is, uh, kind of, can you, can you walk a mile in my shoes? Can you look at this from the way that I see it and understand that it may be very much different from the way that you see it? But my perspective is just as valid as yours. And so we have whole classes of people who don't speak English, who have a variety of communication challenges, who may be deaf and speak ASL and how much do general legislative bodies hear them um, to people who have different perspectives and our ability to hear is influenced by our ability to understand and to be open to those perspectives. And so if the world views aren't the same, as we started off talking about definitions and words and meaning making, they can be mm, confusing um, and often discounted because your perspective and worldview is not the same as mine, and therefore I am marginalizing or negating your reality. Mm. Yeah. So building on that, what is intersectional equity? Because that's a subset of equity more generally that you talk about. So I want to give you a chance to talk about intersectional equity Mm -hmm. as well. Well, intersectional equity, again, comes out of the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, and it's really looking at this whole question that we have so many identities. And so just I'll take myself, for example, you all can look at me and tell that I'm a woman of African-American ancestry. And so there are uh, two definitions that are right there. And I can be marginalized because of the female part of you and certain enclaves, um, People may be fine with the fact that I'm of African ancestry, but I'm a woman. I could also be marginalized in other enclaves because of my racial and ethnic identity. And intersectional equity is really being able to look at a whole person who may embody numerous identities and still see their values and assets. Uh, Crenshaw's work looks, for example, I'd use a woman who is Haitian, who has a disability, who is LGBTQ, and um, is an immigrant. Now, all of those identities 
would be marginalized in a tradition, traditional frame. She mm. wasn't born in the U.S. She speaks Haitian Creole. She has a disability and she's LGBTQ. And so consequently, it's a question of how you look at the inherent dignity of that person. And it should not be in spite of, it's the invitation of bringing the glory of all of the assets and strengths that that person has, as opposed to categorizing them and marginalizing them. Mm. And so it's the opportunity for her to have ability to be seen heard, connected, and recognized. And I think that this is a big challenge at this particular moment in U.S. society. It's yeah. back to the comment about silos and how we tend to silo people. And it's also a question of perspective sharing. And can we be patient long enough to listen to perspectives, which may not be ours? and understand the value and validity in those perspectives. What is the paradox of differences? The paradox of differences, this is just a simple kind of, all of us are members and part of the human family. All of us are human. And so we have a ton in common if we really look at it. We are not polar bears. We are not seals. We are not jellyfish. But we are also like some people. So in looking at these categories, I may have more in common with people who are women. I may have more in common with people who grew up in Ohio, which is where I grew up. I may have more in common with people um, who are of African ancestry. Um, mm. But I myself am unique. And so it's this issue of I do have things in common with certain groups and I can make connections probably a little bit easier because mm. we're basing it as we're talking about worldview and perspectives on a common perspective, but I am unique myself. And so I think sometimes we get into trouble. I'm, I'm concerned that we don't necessarily have a full appreciation of us all being members of the same human family. And mm. can we really all recognize our inherent glory and dignity and assets? Going back to the positive psychology frame, because that positivity then should tell me if I'm a member of a human family and this Haitian woman with a variety of identities is a member of the human family, there is something glorious in all of us. And a lot of times we are focused far more on deficits and differences than we are on the human connection. And then the individual identity, how can we also begin to appreciate the uniqueness that each of us bring? There is not another Scott Barry Kaufman. Um, you and your glory, Scott, you're unlike any other person in the, in the world. You call um, me weird. I didn't say weird. I didn't use that word. I said, you're not, you're unlike, and you are, you are the one and only, you are the very yeah. best. Scott I Barry know, Kaufman. Teasing. In there. I'm, I'm teasing you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it's true. And uh, it's true um, for better and worse. <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> we're all imperfect humans. Right. And, uh, but we're all, you know, um, well, most, most of us are trying, trying to do good in the world, which is, I, I think, I, I believe, well, you know, Christine, this is a really, really interesting sort of toggle here between on the one hand, you want to emphasize the importance of recognizing social identity. And uh, you talked about intersectionality. But on the other hand, we you, you say we really want to recognize the common humanity we have with, with each other. And some people kind of treat those things as either or, you know, like there are people, there are people um, yeah. and even listeners of this podcast that are heavy, heavy critics of the intersectionality kind of ideal. They say, you know, that it's actually dividing. It's doing more, more harm than good. It's, it's causing us to divide each other and see each other um, based on these categories like race and sex and, and sexual mm -hmm. identity, as opposed to what we have in common and and i don't want to put words in your mouth but but i suspect you're you're saying look it's not either or folks <laughs> it's not you either have a common humanity it's, or you appreciate any but we mm -hmm. can appreciate lots of aspects uh, of a human and mm -hmm. and what we have in mm -hmm. common am i putting words in your mouth or is that a fair summation 
No, you're being fair. And I do think this gets to the notion of being seen, that mm. all of us, I think, want to be seen. It's a part of being recognized. It's the thing in us as little children pulling on our parents or family coattails saying, look at me, you know, is what a two-year-old will do. <laughs> And kind of say, me, 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 me. We all want this. We want to be valued and seen and loved, plain and simple. Mm. You know, looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's it's an innate component of each of us. But seeing yeah. that means I want you to be able to see my beauty. The fact that I am of African-American ancestry, I can't change that. The fact that I'm a woman, the fact that, you know, and so if you look at people, the fact that Dr. Braun from Brunner is from Russia, the fact that Dr. Prylotinsky is from Argentina. I mean, these are things, this is who this person is. And so can you value them in their inherent dignity and beauty and wisdom? Though that experience may make them slightly different from someone who is from Iowa, uh, someone who is of a different gender or religious or sexual orientation, whatever the case may be. So it's not the division. What it's saying is there are assets here in this frame. And so to me, it's a question in a world, if we move away from this notion around scarcity and abundance, it's not a zero sum game of there's less for me if you have a seat at the table. Can we get a bigger table? So all of us can be at the same table and it's not displacing anyone, it's additive. So in my mind, it's a question of adding value. Some of the perspectives, I have a dear friend who um, immigrated as a child from Vietnam. And when I talked to her about her experiences, completely different than Christine Robinson who grew up outside of Cleveland, Ohio, I learn, I learn about a different experience, worldview, perspective, what it's like to come in your formative years and make a new home and come from a family where many of your family members have been murdered and how mm. profound that experience is. We both experienced trauma as I, you know, talk about my own background growing up to 24-hour police protection when we moved into an all-white neighborhood as a child. But my trauma was very different than her trauma of fleeing, um, you know, and leaving Hanoi and getting in a boat and coming with her parents. Totally different story. But it's a fascinating conversation of our commonalities. And I'm just using that as an example of we share a common human family. We also share. I am like some people. I can share in some of those experiences of how you overcame trauma and challenge and being othered and being ostracized and singled out and being told by a dominant culture that you aren't valued for your gender, for your racial and ethnic identity for your accent, which she still has to this day. She doesn't speak English as fluently, and how could she? So I I think that the intersectional piece, there is a, a, a way, a greeting in Africa that basically says when people see each other, it is, I see you. And I mm -hmm. love that because what it's saying, it's an affirmation. If so I good. see you, Scott, I'm seeing you, and I'm I'm thrilled if, if, if you are neurodivergent, if you are a male, of your Jewish ancestry, these are all assets. I'm interested. I want to know more. Tell me more about the assets within those various identities and many others that you bring to the table. And I want to understand. And seeing you doesn't make me feel divided from you. It makes me, it encourages me to learn more, I believe from you this is so interesting it seems to me like it shouldn't it's not really seeing it's listening because you know you mm -hmm. you could see things about me that are not my identities i mean i do think i'm male <laughs> i do but I, i'm saying in terms of how strong is that a part of my identity you know there, mm -hmm. there are other things mm -hmm. that i would much more uh rather like even psychologist i would rather put above that or like um uh, you know, just a lot of other things that would come first in the in the line of identities. 
um, than that. Um, so it seems like it just, it just made me think like the word seeing is it's, it's more of a, it's a cook. It's a, it's a dialogue, right? And it goes back to your whole thing about conversation. It's about mm -hmm. lis listening. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I think that what you're saying is very powerful because I think it's an issue of self-definition. And mm. we all know now that how people define themselves and choose to be seen, I think there's another step in respectful interactions of asking people. Um, just as you very respectfully asked me about my pronouns as I sound signed on to your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's, uh, for the remainder of today, let's talk a little bit about your uh, changes to the standard definition or your modified definition of community psychology. You have a modified definition of dignity. Let me pull you. You said the revised definition of community psychology urges us to build on human and communal assets and move from tragedy and trauma to dignity and restoration. What is the shift you're trying to make here? You know, like, yeah, I'd really, I, I want to, I really want you to be able to articulate it's, that it's, to our audience. Yeah. This is looking at an asset frame as opposed to a deficit frame. And mm -hmm. so I strongly believe in the co-creation, meaning how do we build with people? What do we do with people and not to them? And so as we move from an expert stance to a partner stance, and I think it is something that merits thought in academic realms is who are the real experts in community? I think an operative word in community psychology, of course, is the word community. And so if you look at community being a neighborhood, or you could look at it from a societal perspective, who are those who really have expertise? And if we're looking at dignity, do I get to define that? Or is it an expert on the outside who decides what dignified treatment is? And a lot of times when you ask people what their needs are, what their wants are, what their priorities are, they may be different than what you may think as an outside expert. And so I believe strongly that it's important for us to leave the expert stance at the door if we are going to be open and ask, how, how can I help? What would be of use? I learned part of this in my work in philanthropy of going into communities and systems change work, saying, well, these are the things that we could offer for the community. And when you ask the community, their response may be, well, what we really want here are street lights and a full service grocery store. And that may not be in the purview of that particular foundation to build a full service grocery store in the middle of the neighborhood. But if it's a neighborhood where there's a food desert, that could indeed be one of the most important things for the people who live there. And so often mm -hmm. this notion of philanthropy, of social change, social engineering, if you will, of what we think populations may need or want may not be the same thing that they need or want if you sit down and talk to them. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Again, and come, come back to listening, the listening part. Um, there's... A couple def a couple uh, changes you made to the standard definition of community psychology. Um, one is you replaced the term communities that's often used in the um, it's community. It says it's in the def the thing def community psychology. Maybe you should mm -hmm. we change it to mm -hmm. you're saying change it, it maybe to inclu inclusive society psychology. <laughs> maybe that's right. That's one change. Well, yeah. Yeah, and I talk about inclusive society because of Bronfenbrenner's influence. I think the community, and I get where it's coming from, it's a, it's our communal interactions with each other, but some people would take that to be a neighborhood, if you will. Uh, and because we are structured as a nation the way that we are with systems and policies and infrastructure from the federal to the regional to the uh, municipal and or county level into neighborhoods, we have to look beyond just the community. Um, the community of course has power, but not when we're looking at a lot of the systemic structural changes that could actually enhance well-being. So I think that, that that's an important thing. Um, and, and not that the entire name of the field should be changed, but I think that it goes far beyond in quotation marks, a neighborhood. And it's here we go again, talking about words and definitions. What is a community? 
Is it a neighborhood? Or now we could talk about a virtual community. Now in this COVID world, there are communities that span geography and there are communities of um, positive psychologists, for example, that span the globe. Yeah. And it is part of a community, but it doesn't have a neighborhood footprint. It's not these two square miles, for example. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point, and uh, and also the distinction between community and society. I mean, society seems thing more like nebulous, abstract, and um, you know, who is the society we keep talking about when we say society doesn't believe in X, society doesn't like Y. Well, certain communities sure can, you know. And what are the community, right? <laughs> what that's to me, communities yeah. just feels more concrete. It feels more like you know what mm -hmm. you're, what are you embedded in, you know. And uh, so I like it. Mm -hmm. Another uh, change to your definite to the definition of community psychology is the insertion of co-creation alongside capacity building. You say, "quote co-creating potential pathways to address the numerous cycles of socialization, unbraiding deficit narratives, and work spanning all levels of civic discourse address structural and systemic causative." I'm having trouble reading this. Causative factors <laughs> in community psychology practice. Can you unpack that a little bit? That's a yes. That's really yes. a lot. There's a lot there. Yeah. There's a lot there. <laughs> well, the co-creation piece is doing things with people instead of doing things to people, and so mm. we're backing into the having a conversation and listening. There's an assumption about causation, and I think that so much of the psychological research with theories that base the, the, the root cause of elements. And what is the root cause really? And I think here we go again, back to this whole question around meaning making and analysis and perspective. Um, if you ask the root cause of certain things that have happened in certain populations, you're gonna get very different answers across the country. And so I think it's really a call in community psychology to make certain that you've got room at the table for very diverse perspectives. I know in the paper I quote the disability rights movement talking about nothing about us without us. And I think that that spans all of the various communities that you could be in us. That if we are going to do something a community, it's not just the, in quotation marks, city fathers or city mothers or the uh, city council or the board of selectmen or some academic institutions who would come in and develop a blueprint. It's the residents and the people who work there, who live there, who worship there, who walk the streets every day. Their perspectives could be very, very different. And for some reason, here we go again with the power dynamics, we tend to discount the voices of those people. Um, so that's going back to the way that I grew up with my mother, who's basically saying, let's find a way. My son was born brain damaged. Is there not a way that we can have an educational system that is inclusive and includes children who are developmentally disabled? And is this not in the societal interest. So the co-creation, a lot of that, certainly I've learned over my career, but I also learned it as a child growing up because it was her vigilance. When I was a kid, I never knew where we were going. She would pick me up from school. We'd be in the mayor's office, the superintendent of schools, the county commissioner's office. And she would say, I have a child. He is not a disgrace. He is eight years old and he's unable to go to school and he was born severely brain damaged. Is there a way that we can work across this county to develop an educational system that's inclusive of all children? Yes. Amen. Amen. I, I definitely agree with that. And and these things, these these forms of discrimination have very significant impacts on chronic stress and our biological functioning and our ability to self-actualize. This is this is why this 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 in, inextricably inextricably intertwined nature of all these different elements matters, right? Now you can you talk a little bit about some of that research? Sure. A lot of the work of um, Dr. Bruce McEwen, uh, who was a neuroscientist at uh, Rockefeller University, he passed about a year ago, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but he did amazing work on allostatic load. And so what we find is children who experience discrimination, it can be their own experience of it or observing a parent. You know, I go into a, a restaurant and my parents are not seated. I go into a store and they just overlook us and let us sit there. Bullying on the playground, 
uh, looking at police brutality, looking at racial profiling in the various media outlets. Um, and this is traumatic. And what it results in is, quite frankly, everything that we don't want to see in an educational system. A decrease in self-efficacy, an increased sense of hopelessness, increase in depression. And we know that lifelong in his research, he's documented in impacts and effects such as increase in low birth weight in the, the children of um, these children who've been affected, increase in um, immune deficiency, which is one of the major issues we're dealing with now with COVID-19, and uh, increase in a number of chronic stress conditions. So we all know a lot about health disparities and hypertension and stroke, um, cancer, a number of illnesses that are chronic, but the stress component that's part of these illnesses can be directly traced back to a lot of the chronic stress and stressors of struggling in a world that does not recognize your inherent dignity and back to chronic vigilance. Um, Dr. David Williams tells a story of a, a black man who every time he goes to the corner store, just to the 7-Eleven, puts on a suit coat and a white shirt and a tie because he knows that he will be treated differently. And just being under that kind of, kind of pressure, every time I leave my home, I need to pay attention to how I speak, to how I'm dressed, to what I say, to what I do, puts our entire system under a lot of stress in comparison to someone who's got a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. I need a gallon of milk. I'm going to hop in, hop out and keep on going. It's a different type of living, if you will. This is why I started wearing a suit uh, on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> people weren't taking me seriously. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a new thing, a new development. Um, <laughs> It's true. Okay, so I want to, well, let's end with this idea of uh, cultural intelligence. Um, well, this idea, um, uh, Ting Tumi, right? 1999 seminal paper mm -hmm. outlined four mm -hmm. stages, mm -hmm. uh, four stage process to move toward cultural intelligence. Let's get us moving there. Let's leave on that note, getting us all moving you towards got it. cultural intelligence. Yeah. You got it. Um, Ting Tumi's work, and she, um, her area is act of expertise is actually international. Uh, communications, the University of California, Fullerton. And I've been really struck by her work because she, first of all, tells us that Americans drastically overestimate uh, their ability and fluency with other cultures. Um, the reality of their ability to take on other perspectives, the actual ability of Americans to take on other perspectives is not very high, very much seeing things in a very prescribed view. Um, she calls that unconscious incompetent, unconscious incompetence, excuse me. We are unconsciously incompetent and unaware of what we don't know. And that ignorance in and of itself is a problem because we're stumbling over um, our own two feet and making assumptions about who other people are and who other people aren't. What she wants us to move on to as the next step is moving to be consciously incompetent. And it's interesting here because it's recognizing the fact that I don't know really? much about you. Uh, you're, yeah. you're from Rwanda and I realize that I don't know a lot about people from Rwanda or from Venezuela or from uh, Bhutan. And so could you tell me a little bit, can I understand a little bit? And how can I understand more about these realities? Moving up that ladder is getting to conscious competence, where I can feel comfortable in these communities. And actually unconscious incompetence is the highest level where we actually have proficiency and mastery. And so I uh, make this akin almost to uh, professional endeavor. If I was, uh, uh, the medical equivalent is that I have to become aware of the challenge. I have to practice. I have to internalize the skills before I become a master. I have a number of friends who are physicians, some extraordinarily talented surgeons. We're talking about 12, 14, even 16 years with some of them of what it takes to be the person in the middle of the night. If you're in an automobile accident and you end up in the emergency room, 
I am unconsciously competent because I know exactly what I need to do. And so it, it, I think that we are at an inflection point as a nation where many people feeling, oh, I read a book. I listened to a podcast. I'll do respect yeah. to Scott. I know, I know. <laughs> and now I've got this, I got this down pat. Um, yeah, and if we look at the number of identities that we need to address, be it race, ethnicity, LGBTQ, socioeconomic status, people who are housing insecure, who are food insecure, who speak languages than other other than English, just a black white dynamic in the US is not going to cut it. And so mm -hmm. it's really beginning to develop the listening skills, the patience, the questioning skills to understand that my worldview is indeed valid. It is my worldview, but it may not be your worldview. And so entering into a conversation, how do I understand where the other person is coming from? And if I really honor and value them as an equal, that's the co-creation part, I invite their reality into the dialogue. And therefore, I'm moving to a realm of um, cultural competence. I have a quick story that I want to just share. And it goes back to my own experience when I started to really bring, talk about bringing theory to practice. Um, I, I had the fortunate opportunity when I was in graduate school to work for the Department of Public Health on an infant mortality project. And very much the same, we didn't call it health disparities then, but that's exactly what it was. And why were we seeing such a disparity in infant mortality and morbidity among African-American, Latinx, Haitian, Cape Verdean, Mi'kmaq, Indian, Vietnamese, Khmer, uh, Laotian women, and I worked in inner city Boston. And one of the first questions in doing the focus groups with these various communities, and they were all translated, so I had the wonderful opportunity to go into different communities, but they said, your grocery store is really hard for me. You wrap your fresh fruits and vegetables in plastic, and I can't tell how fresh they are because I can't touch them. I go into the dairy section, but I don't understand this because there are no cows in Vietnam, the Cape Verde Islands, Haiti. Um, and so I don't eat anything there. I go to your fish section and you fillet all the fish. You cut the heads off so I can't tell how fresh they are by the clarity of their eyes. And you take the bones out. And I used to chew the bones as a source of calcium in my country, but the bones aren't there. And instead, I look, even though I don't speak English, I'm standing at the bus stop, I see the ads on the side of the bus, I see the billboards, I see the pictures on TV, and I want to eat like an American. The Americans are the richest country in the world. So I buy Coca-Cola and potato chips and candy bars and pizza, because why would the government put those things on television and advertise for them if they weren't good for you? And so just in that story, it was fascinating. These are people coming from countries where the government controlled the media. And so their yeah. assumption is that everything advertised is good for you. Their world experience and what they know. And so it wasn't a surprise to me when you're looking at nutritional intake that there are huge nutritional deficits and you would expect the very outcomes that we were seeing. But it was, I just think it's a really interesting example of I used listening, I listened to their voice, and I'm understanding, okay, from their perspective, this is where the co-creation piece comes in. I myself as a black woman growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, would never have come to those kinds of conclusions without right. their input and in helping us figure out as a public health system how we should address some of these challenges. Yeah. Yeah. This is such a great point. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, it certainly relates to our political landscape and messaging from your favorite politicians and believing them about certain things and how that influences um, how you interact with others and um, how you, particularly those that may differ from you, right? I'm being very abstract here, but you know what I'm saying? Look, um, Christine, I just want to thank you so, so much for being on my podcast today, for being my friend, and for um, the amazing research you're doing. I really hope that, I really hope we get, we get this out there more, uh, your work. So thank you.
<laughs> me too. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. So I wish you all the best and thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.